Attention, Link Marines. No, I'm just playing. So in this video, we are about to do an extreme deep, deep dive on an essential but complex protocol in Chainlink. We're going to talk about why it's important. What is an Oracle? We're going to talk about their competitors. We're going to go through the tokenomics. And then at the end, we're going to talk about if we're buying or not. We're going to go through the technical analysis. And I'm going to show you a way that you can accumulate Chainlink passively via yield farming in a, in a relatively low risk way. If you guys have been watching us, you know that the project that I'm most bullish on in the crypto space is Chainlink long term. And in this episode, you will truly understand why. So before we actually get started, guys, we do have to say that this video should not be taken as financial advice. Please consult your financial advisor before making any investment decisions. This video is for your education purposes only. And as we always say, do your own research. So also this video is sponsored by, well, I guess no one, but hey, if someone wants to fill that spot, you just hit us up, okay? Cause that felt natural to start saying we're sponsored by someone. Anyway, go ahead. Yep. So, all right. So let's, let's start off with what is Chainlink and, you know, talk a little bit on like why we're interested in it right now. So Chainlink is an Oracle provider, right? And essentially, I'm going to read off the definition that the CEO, Sergey Nazarov, gave because I liked it. So he says, Oracle does computation in a trust-minimized way about anything you want trust-minimized and have consensus about what's outside of a blockchain. Okay. So not only can Oracle's feed info into blockchains and enable them to do things from DeFi, GameFi, decentralized finance, they can also connect exist existing systems to blockchains so that, you know, banking systems, central banking systems using SWIFT, the DTCC, which we're going to talk about later, uh, they create like a center point for them to all connect and pretty much use. And blockchains talk to TradFi, TradFi talk to blockchains. So this bi this bi-directional relationship leads to greater trust minimization. A verifiable web, which is the evolution of the internet that we all want, the vision that we all have. And that verifiable web is immune to various manipulations of, you know, keeping people's money safe, reneging on contractual agreements, um, and just being subject to AI manipulation, like any kind of manipulation, period. Yeah, so it's not actually um, a blockchain. So for yeah. one, so that's contrary to, I don't know if that's a popular belief, but I would just assume that everyone thinks that Chainlink is a blockchain and it's not, it's actually just a network of oracles. So this is one thing if Sergey was on here, he would be very adamant about, you know, it's not one oracle, Chainlink, it's not an oracle, it's an oracle network. So it's a network built up of different validators, which group together, they create consensus and those groups are what we consider oracles. And so Chainlink, the Oracle network, allows you to bring essentially external real world data and onto the blockchain. So when it comes to tokenizing assets, for example, and tokenization is putting real world assets on the blockchain. But the problem with tokenization has always been tracking the value of the real world asset in which is tokenized, right? And so this allows you to actually track the value of that real world asset. You can bring data such as like weather prices random numbers whatever it may be and bring it onto the blockchain and have a, a a constant tracking of that number or value and those validators in the oracle networks their entire job is effectively to secure validate and transfer that value across blockchains yeah people like to call it uh you'll hear this term blockchain agnostic which means they can operate on any blockchain, but they are not a blockchain, like JT said. You could you could put physical receipts on the blockchain as well, which is crazy. So like even if you wanted to uh, store them there for tax purposes or as a business, that's just where all your data lies of each transaction. So you could pretty much have things tracked in the real world in, in a traditional sense in which you normally do. And then you can have that extra layer of security when it comes to data keeping by tracking that data on a blockchain effectively. Yep, yep. So let's talk about why we're making this video right now, which, what what kind of got us excited. And well, that because is, I love it. No, <laughs> <laughs> that too, that too. But the reason why we love it 
is uh, they're rolling out. I don't know if it's rolled out completely or they're just rolling out, but CCIP, which is cross-chain interoperability protocol. So I feel like that's one of those things that will always be in development, but they've announced the launch of it. Okay. So again, I'm going to read off the, def the definition that um, Sergey gave CCIP. I keep wanting to say CCPIP because of TCPIP, <laughs> but it's CCIP. So this is a single internet of contracts where all bank chains and public blockchains can connect to each other. So if you think of like this bank chain that needs to talk to this blockchain, CCPIP is in the middle. Or if you have this blockchain that needs to talk to this blockchain so it can talk to this bank chain, CCP, CCIP <laughs> is in the middle. It's almost like a central hub, right? Mm -hmm. And if you study the parallels or the growing pains that the internet had to go to, it's kind of the same thing that blockchains are going through right now. We're in the dial-up stages of the blockchain. So in the beginning, you had like people running different databases, networking technology that didn't connect to other databases until TCP IP came along, which stands for Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol. And once that happened, all of these different internet servers and network providers were able to talk to each other on one internet. And that's how we're able to go from website to website. And even how we're able to send emails from one email provider to the next. Like, could you imagine how annoying it would be if you, like, let's say JT had a Yahoo and I had a Gmail, but in order for me to email him, I would have to get a Yahoo or he would have to get a Gmail. But TCP IP a lot makes it so that it doesn't matter what email provider he use, it's all connected. So he can, he can email it to me. Now, in a world where Gmail exists, I would never use a Yahoo for the record. But anyway, go ahead. Seriously. <laughs> so before before I talk about why this is beneficial to pretty much every major financial institution, did you want to touch on CCIP and your definition? Yeah, so I, I guess I, I would look at it like this. So it's a standard for communication. So if you want to for the people who already understand crypto and nfts for example like the erc 721 that's a standard for protocol within the ethereum ecosystem ccip is a standard for communicating or transferring value across any blockchain or part of that network and so you can look at it like that as like you said that central point so yeah now you can have smart contracts that are sent from one chain to another those commands aren't muddled, those commands aren't tampered with, and those if-then statements, uh, they persist throughout the entire bridging process. So there won't be any hacks, there won't be any rerouting of information or anything like that, because you have that standard protocol in the middle and CCIP, which allows you to communicate seamlessly like that. So yeah, it's going to be, it's literally ultra-valued, effectively. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's a good way of explaining it. So why, like, everyone's talking about this vision of these large financial institutions when i say large financial institutions, i'm talking sovereign wealth funds governments central banks family offices uh large hedge funds etc why do they even give a damn about being on chain well faster transactions greater security any company no matter what it is its biggest liability is its honeypot of data regarding its users and its own internal data. Like you hear, this company is getting hacked all the time that we don't even hear about, right? So getting on chain will kind of help solve these issues, but getting on chain isn't as easy as it sounds. Like you have these companies that have technology that's been around for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years sometimes. So, and it's working to a certain extent. It's not so bad that they want to scrap it and start over. So they need something to connect it, right? So yeah, a lot of them don't want to put money into the development of an internal private blockchain either, because then you have to put interoperability. You have to build interoperability within that blockchain, which is a complex task within itself, and it's going to cost a ton of money. So a lot of them, they don't even want to go through that. Exactly. So this uh, literally eliminates that problem, and they don't have to create a blockchain to participate in a blockchain network. Yeah. So going back to why these like these banks getting on chain. So with CCIP, these banks don't have to do that. They don't have to like start over. They'll get set up on CCIP. And like we said, this is a hub for integrating them with other banks and their own specific chains because each bank will have their own chain. And we'll talk about that later, as well as other public and private blockchains. 
Do you so, think this is something to insert a question here? Do you think this is something that will be adopted from the top down or bottom up? Meaning, do you think that larger banks will start to take advantage of this first? Or do you think it will start from like smaller non-bank banks that leverage it and then the larger banks start to see the value and take it on after them? What do you think about that? Because that changes the trajectory of the growth of this service. I think it'll be bottom down, top up, and kind of meet in the middle. Like you already have smaller parties doing it, and you definitely have like we already know what's going on with Swift and DTCC that we're going to talk about later. Actually, wait a minute. It's, that's crazy that I just asked that question because uh, that question is answered throughout this video. Actually, um, we're going to get to the Swift partnership, but that literally answers the question. Well, in terms of like smaller players adopting it, it's mostly crypto protocol. So maybe top down if you're talking uh, about a hundred percent top down. Yeah, uh, okay. it's top down. This is thanks to the Swift partnership that changes everything, man. But anyway, we can continue. Yeah. So 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 CCIP will be able to connect automatically instead of them having to do it natively. And like JT said, first they wouldn't be able to do it anyway, right? Because it's going to be expensive. They're going to get it. They're going to have to get it audited. They're going to have to retrain all of their employees on things that they've been teaching them for 50 years, which they don't want to do, like all these things. However, now they need to do it because they're, this is where they're going to be able to access their liquidity, their customers, their users, other banks. So it's almost like, like they're going to have to do it. So individual banks are going to have their own chain um, and they're going to need to track. They're going to need to transact with each other, whether if it's movement of a token or movement of data. And for those of you who don't know, we're going to get to Swift again. I feel like we keep saying that. But Swift is the largest protocol for transacting private key signatures in terms of value and data. Like Swift is also a messaging protocol. So Swift, just to keep it simple, so they help transfer, they transfer capital back and forth between banks effectively. Banks and major corporations, like with their yeah. corporate treasuries. Yeah, so basically the gist is when it comes to like people creating applications, application creators don't want to create infrastructure. They want to create applications with the help of already stable infrastructure. So when it comes to like banks, I guess you, you can kind of look at, you can look at Swift as the infrastructure and the bank as the application creators because they're operating on top of it. The banks don't want to create a whole new blockchain and a whole right. new this. They just want to operate on something that helps them run their business more efficiently or connect to something that helps them run their business more efficiently. Exactly, exactly. But I was just gonna add, you know, it's funny when it comes to uh, trust, you know, we're not used to thinking about having to trust our bank or having to trust that our transactions won't get uh, rerouted or stolen when we do a bank transaction, right? So I use Bank of America and like I'll, I use Zelle all the time. That's the platform that banks use to send money. It's like owned by all the large banks, right? If you guys haven't known that. And I never have, like if I Zelle you cash or you Zelle me cash, I never fear that that money will disappear in transit, you know, until it happens, right? Because effectively what happened with SVB could happen with, I guess, any bank. But because, you know, the larger banks are a bit different, they have the backstop of the Fed, so it really won't happen. But yeah, it's just not something we have to think about until someone's involved in a situation in which they lost money, like the FTX participants or even the SVB participants. Bro, you can almost, I wonder if there was data on this, how many people who had money locked up in SVB, like I wish we could track what was the percentage that had a sentiment change when it came to stable coins and what percentage start going to stable coins because they would eliminate that risk of the fractional reserve from a small bank. Yeah, I just wonder what that number will look like. But yeah, we're not used to thinking about something like that. But even this right here, it eliminates like the second layer of trust and I'm referring to CCIP. So obviously you have, it eliminates the trust between banks within itself. So for the end consumer as well, it eliminates like two layers of trust that would normally be there when it comes to the counterparty you got to trust your bank and then the bank has to trust the bank that they're transacting with and so this literally removes like both layers of trust so that's what when he says trust minimization i would say that's part of what he means that's a beautiful way to put it so let's let's keep talking about ccip and, and let's talk about how it's evolving just like 
the internet was evolving and talk about the problems of uh, like even at the beginning, TCP IP had had problems, right? So like basically, you know, we're talking about all these banks getting on chain and all these companies getting on chain. Let's talk about how Web3 works currently and let's talk about the vision that CCIP have. So right now, and this is just like the previous internet, like when the internet came about and TCP IP came about, it was basically the basis of what's called a client server model. The client is you and the server is like, pretty. basically just think of your website. So the client is the user, the server is the website. In the beginning, you had to like have all your servers and you had to like have firewalls so you wouldn't get hacked. Like imagine if you wanted to build a website, like you go on Wix right now, but back in the day, you had to go buy a server, learn how to set it up, have it running in your house, keep them all cool, make sure no one breaks in. You got to have like security. And then we had like Apple and Amazon and Microsoft. They pretty much in Google have all these server firms. And now like your website is still on a server, but you just don't see it. Like they came through and they made it easy. What I like about CCIP is like they're offering that same service, but through decentralized networks so that the internet isn't owned by one company or a few companies. And like JT was saying at the beginning, the, or, these oracles are thousands of networks. It's not just one network. It's thousands of different networks. OK, so it's like right now how Web3 works is you have to if you want to like do a transaction, let's say you just want to do a transaction, you have to go to your wallet. You have to take the value out. Let's call it a stable coin. Let's say you want to use an application on uh, Arbitrum and then it's on ETH. You have to put it in a bridge. You have to use a bridge. You have to take it out of the bridge. And that's if you use the safe bridge. You can use something like Stargate or another bridge, but you run the risk of being hacked. OK, so that's one thing you can shorten that part but you do increase, increase your risk. You put it back in your wallet, then you use your desired app. The value you get from said app, you have to go back to your wallet, take it out, do the bridge process all over again, take it out, and then you're done. CCIP has figured out a way to do that whole transaction in one fell swoop. Not only does it make it quicker, but given that it's all done in one transaction, you don't have to pay multiple gas fees, because every time you're doing that stuff, you're paying gas fees, you're saving time, and you're saving money not only that you're not going to have to go to that different chain set up a new wallet get a new public address like you're not even going to have to like do anything on that different train you just have your one wallet and ccip you connect to it and now you can do all of your stuff eliminating fragmentation increases security 100 percent, and that's what ccip does you're right 100 percent on that so with uh, another another feature of you know, the Oracle network in terms of security and eliminating that fragmentation is that each Oracle is specifically designed for service. And so let's let me split up two. So I'm going to talk about weather and talk about uh, stock prices, for example. So let me use a more real world. Let's say real estate prices, for example, um, a price of a hard asset. So with weather you're going with the weather you're going to have a group of validators or oracles specifically designed to come to consensus on weather data so these are like these aren't values these are these are like hard weather data so you have the specific group dedicated to that and then you have another group of validators or oracles that are specifically designed to attract those real estate asset prices and so there won't be any confusion. There won't be any, uh, it eliminates the possibility of rogue actors as well. It also increases efficiency as well. And it increases once again, the security of that particular service. So within it's, uh, you can look at the chain link network, like a constellation of oracles, basically. And each part of the, or piece in that constellation is specifically designed for a particular service. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. It's like it's almost like the division of labor. Like we have all these cells mm -hmm. in our body that does different things. It's the same thing with these Oracle providers. They are specified for a specific thing within, right. you know, TradFi or blockchain or um, or Web3. Right. So so let's talk about how, you know, we hear about the CEO of BlackRock, Larry Fink. Yeah. Yeah. Make Talk sure about, I get that right. I've, yeah, I said a few yeah, wrong things on a couple of episodes. Yeah, right. 
you you hear Larry Fink getting super excited about tokenizing or in TradFi it's called securitizing and blockchain is called tokenizing, but they both mean the same thing in the sense that they stamp like you let's say you want to tokenize this bottle, you stamp it on some kind of database that gives all the data around it so that now it's liquid and it can be traded back and forth. So I would say they mean two you, different things, by the way. Um, what would, what would you say securitization the and tokenization. So securitization is really you can look at it as turning something into a security, a digital security. And so whether that's a piece of real estate turning into or going into a basket of mortgage-backed securities, that's securitizing the real estate asset. Tokenization is in a blockchain sense uh, bringing something onto the blockchain and having a token associated with it, like literally. And so tokenization is bringing something onto the blockchain. Securitization is turning something digital, but it's turning it digital in a security sense, which is the securitization part. What if the, the what if the token still considered a security? If because they're if they're bringing these assets on chain, no, it seems like the same they could be. Me. Well, they could be. So it could be something that's tokenized and also a security. And so by tokenizing that, you could be securitizing that. So remember that platform. I think they what were they called? But they did the STO security token offerings. What's the company called? Uh, Polymath. It wasn't Polymath. Uh, Not sure. Somebody in the comments to let us know. But they were doing the STOs, the security token offerings, and what they were doing is securitizing already tokenized assets. Does that make sense? Securitizing. So they were bringing assets off the blockchain to TradFi? So they're still on the blockchain. So remember you had the ICO craze. This was another way of going public while trying to adhere with the existing rules. Hmm. That's what an FTO was basically. And so securitizing, you could securitize something that is tokenized and it doesn't have to be tokenized. You could securitize a this apartment building, for example, you know, uh, you can also tokenize this apartment building now. So and to tokenizing doesn't adhere to the SEC's rules, for example. So like I could tokenize an asset and I can't really transact in it because it would be considered a security. But if I were to securitize that asset, tokenized asset, I can now transact with it, which is how, you know, they were able to sell a few houses on the blockchain years ago. And you're saying when you securitize it, it doesn't automatically have a token. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean it has a token when you okay. securitize something, but you sec you can securitize. I feel like I'm, it's not such a weird world now because we're we saying it's so no, much. that makes sense. You can securitize a tokenized asset, right? And so even with that, even within that statement, you can see that they're two different things, but sometimes they're they're coinciding with each other. It's like other, the same idea, the same. but it's different. Yeah. So let's talk about how. Banks coming on chain can help crypto. And now I'm not just talking about the narrative like, oh, the banks and financial institutions are already on chain, but it can actually help stabilize it. And I'm not just talking about from a buy-in standpoint. So you banks are in the business of creating financial products. Like you were just talking about securitizing. They'll securitize anything they can get their hands on. And tokenizing is just like an evolution of that and that it can help them put value to more things and pretty much sell them more. So banks are going to create these real world asset tokens to be used in DeFi. And this is going to help diversify the collateral within DeFi. And, you know, to do that, you're going to need proof of reserves, um, obviously, or not obviously. Chainlink is the largest provider of that. And basically, like proof of reserves works like, let's say I want to buy some tokenized gold. Well, if I have a smart contract connected to it, every time that gold gets moved, the oracle is going to update like my token in advance so i'm going to know how much is worth and not just you know think i do or have an idea or have to rely on some external source so having that said you'll have value flowing from from banks into DeFi protocols to help them you know increase their tbl all, all that stuff but on the other hand and more importantly these real world asset tokens flowing into the DeFi protocols to be used as collateral. And when I say collateral, like let's say you go on a platform like Aave and you supply collateral, like let's say you supply ETH and you want to borrow some USDC, the value of your ETH drops to a certain point, you're going to get liquidated and lose everything you have except for what you have borrowed that's in your wallet. By bringing these assets on chain, let's say you're able to put treasuries or gold or 
you know, some other tokenized precious metal like uranium or something. And now you're able to supply that on Aave. Well, once the crypto crypto market drops like substantially, which, you know, all markets eventually do, it's not going to create this crazy cascading effect and everything's not going to go to shit because a high percentage of the protocols are backed by treasury bills and these other assets, whatever they want to do it with. And, you know, that'll just help with the narrative of crypto being like some place where you just go to take extreme risk because like the reality is right now we're in this bear market or build market like isaac was calling on the macro monday because people were over leveraged and they weren't just over leveraged but their collateral was all crypto because you can't bring anything into crypto but had people been able to take some of their stock portfolio or some of their treasury portfolio or some of their gold portfolio and put that on as collateral i guarantee you the market would not be as low as it is right now yeah and you know i think you said it in the beginning of uh when you started talking there uh to help stabilize the entire industry that's what you said you used the word stabilize right mm -hmm. so yeah so with stabilization obviously mm -hmm. the most obvious aspect would be the volume that banks and institutions would be transacting on a daily daily basis and so now i mean effect effectively puts a real floor on the crypto market what that floor is i don't know but it, it, it'd get to a point where it's a critical mass and it can't fall below that market cap again and it won't um even with the volatile nature actually wait so with banks it would actually decrease overall volatility over time um making it a more of a stable climb and obviously you have the like you talked about as well the diversification of the asset backing or the collateral and so once again that puts sort of a floor on the market so yeah and also just even from a sentiment perspective if your primary let's say if bank of america is using a blockchain well at that point bro my grandma will probably trust blockchain after that i mean straight up i mean they probably use chase actually so they if chase started using it my grandma will start to trust things on the blockchain what was this chain stuff you know what's this chain stuff you know they, they start experimenting with it like you know what I, I i never trusted banks anyway um and so this allows me to kind of get away from them and, and increase my transparency or whatever it may be so yeah from a sentiment perspective yeah the trust will be outrageous man so it's almost like it's hard it's almost like that exponential growth video it's very hard to visualize the impact that banks and institutions would have when they start to use and leverage blockchain technology or even let's just keep it specific to the ctip protocol through swift i mean it's hard to it's really hard to fathom it is super hard to fathom because especially like you can study the parallels of the internet and look at you know the past that went to growth but the the, the difference is web3 like you had a uh, web1 was read like you go on the internet you read stuff newspapers online web 2 was read write so then you had instagram facebook you can write stuff blogs all that stuff people can communicate web 3 is read write ownership so now you can own protocols that you use like ave tokens etc and the different the 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 thing with that is it's almost like you're able to own tcp ip imagine being able to own a piece of the internet like that's what this evolution oh. is allowing yeah and it just makes you think like damn you know i used to joke all the time like man chain link is going to be more valuable than bitcoin but now i'm actually it's thinking about it and i'm like wait wait it it's actually going to be this used to be a joke it's actually going to be more valuable than bitcoin it's going to have the most fundamental value of any project in the space and i'm i'm saying that boldly right now and this is not just a shoe I don't own like a million chain link or something. So it's not going to be. Are we getting justice. paid to make this video? Yeah, not getting paid at all. I mean, bro, it's it's the the position that they put themselves in with CCIP, just with the Oracle networks alone. And then you throw in CCIP. But not only that, that's objective. Now you throw in the partnership with Swift, and that's you're becoming a staple piece in the DeFi space or the transaction space. And you are a true bridge from TradFi to DeFi. And uh, not financial advice, but this is why 
my most invested asset, the heaviest weight, at one point it was 100% of my portfolio is Chainlink and will probably always be Chainlink until like probably five, 10, 15 years when it hits that true critical mass. And it's like, okay, let me start to decrease my weighting on that because I got, you know, a thousand percent of gains over the years. Bro, I'm telling you, it's, it's gonna be insane, bro. Jesus Christ. Yeah. And we're gonna talk about the tokenomics later and talk about how that lines up. To back to piggyback on your comment on chain link flipping ETH or chain link flipping Bitcoin, it's gonna flip ETH too. Bitcoin is designed to be a store of value. And people always compare it to that's why they compare it to gold. Gold is supposed to be a store of value. They compare things like Ethereum and actual utility. You can say chain links a utility as well to oil because oil is used in our hair. It's used in roads. It's used in making plastic. It's pretty much it has so much utility in different things. And if you think about it this way, utility trumps, trumps store value all day long. And that's the reason why oil is worth more than all precious metals combined. Yeah, it's a utility slash service and the people that they're catering to, I wouldn't even say catering to, but the people who are going to benefit some of the some of the people who are going to benefit. The they're most, catering to everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's like they're not really catering. So I won't say that I won't send the wrong message. But the, I think one of the parties who is going to benefit the most are large banks and institutions, man. I mean, this literally changes the game. Like I said, they, they don't have to create a blockchain, which is a huge impediment. So we've even seen it with JP Morgan. Bro, they spent, I don't know how many years at this point, working on a blockchain protocol. Are, have they launched anything yet officially still? When I log into my JP Morgan app, it says, remember me, and it says use token. So I haven't clicked that thing. I don't know what it is, mm. but I don't know. Okay, yeah, you got to test it and let me know what that is. But it's still not widely marketed even. Uh, even if they do have something. And it's because it's probably still in development right now. They probably spent upwards of $300 million already on development of an in-house blockchain. Most banks don't want to do that and they won't do that. And so having this CCIP literally just been able to connect your infrastructure to a network of blockchains, so not just one, bro, I mean, that is literally a game changer. It's a game changer and yeah, yeah, so they're, bro, they're flipping will happen. But even if there isn't an actual flipping in terms of the dollar value, the intrinsic value of the chain link network, it's in the name, by the way, linking chains, the inherent value huh, uh, inside, a, inside of chain link, it's, I mean, it's unfathomable, bro. I can't. I can't put a number on it. So I it's just, to me, it's just a perfect long-term hold, man. Jesus Christ. But yeah, it's in the name. I was actually thinking about that earlier today. It's like, huh, it's interesting because they, they do what they say. Okay, they're called chain link. What do they do? Well, effectively linking chains. This is what, this is what we do if Very I was much. chain link. So just beautiful, man, just a beautiful. I got to clap you up, Sergey, because what you created here was pretty amazing, man. And I'm not feeling once again, I wish we were getting paid from it, but we're not. It's just a great project. And over time, my conviction within this project over years has only grown stronger because they're continually showing, first off, innovation, but not just innovation. Innovation that is a necessity we didn't even know we need until they do it. I mean, that's that's something that's something truly amazing. So yeah, good stuff by them. Hell yeah. All right. So let's let's keep talking about the banks and the incentive that they have to get on chain. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, GFC, Great Financial Crisis. So like we said earlier, banks create financial products and they sell them to large financial institutions, hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds, large asset managers, um, family offices, etc. So this is going to lead to what Sergey called Securitization 2.0, okay? And Securitization 1.0 is what led to the great financial crisis. You had these investment banks grabbing these, creating what's called mortgage-backed securities. And essentially what they were was there were multiple tiers of mortgages and the tiers were based on the risk of default. And they thought that if you put mortgages where people are had a high likelihood of paying back with people with not as high a likelihood and people with a super low low likelihood 
They thought that they were diversifying their risk and they thought that it was a safe invest safe investment. But once the Federal Reserve raised interest rates, everything went to shit. Um, and so part of that, by the way, it was because it was more subprime, more subprime lending than was warranted and or wanted. And obviously that wasn't realized till later. And so when it came to putting those MBSs in a package, a lot of especially non-banks, smaller banks, uh, they would be putting a bunch of tracks together. So it wouldn't even be tranched out properly. Um, it would just be literally like 60% subprime or, or probably more. And so when those losses took place, when the interest rates rose and people could no longer afford their monthly payments, uh, the hit was actually exacerbated more than it would have been if it was actually a, a, a properly tiered basket of mortgages. But it wasn't properly tiered. Indubitably. And the thing is, and this is what Chainlink is going to solve or CCIP is going to solve, what oracles are going to solve is people will be able to better assess the risk. So banks are going to get to generate large amounts of assets, put them on chain, like literally anything that they want to tokenize. They're going to be able to put them on chain. Like this is what banks do. They create these financial products and they'll be able to sell them to a global, not just domestic market. And in the end, make more money, which is their profit motive. So this can work with oracles because they're going to be able to offer more transparency and allow investors to better assess the risk of bad information, missing information, and information around the underlying asset, which we didn't have in the GFC. So if, for example, if you were trying to sell me a basket of mortgages or mortgage-backed securities, right, I would be able to see before I buy those uh, basket of mortgages the makeup of that actual basket with a, something like CCIP and Oracle networks working together. I would actually be able to see what percentage I would consider subprime if you if you have somehow a different definition, because you know some banks are weird and they try to change the definition of certain things or whatnot. But I would be able to tell which percentage are subprime, which percentage are high quality bars, which percentage is a, a mid-tier or preferred, right? And from that point, I would actually be able to make a decision. So now those losses that you have unrealized on your books it doesn't become systemically a risk um it's actually um i'm still inoculated because i know what i own quality mortgage-backed securities and now i can see what you own so now i know not to buy from you and add those unrealized unrealized losses to my books you know so there is no more hot potato with something like that and so i will be able to tell instantly before i make that purchase so it makes those transactions and counterparty risks way more secure. Good stuff, man. Yeah. So that's a perfect segue into let's talk about how if oracles were around and, you know, companies were on chain during the GFC, how it could have prevented the GFC. So imagine if every mortgage holder had their own smart contract that represented them individually. Right. And every time they got a mortgage, or this, so we're, we're talking about already fully established. Yeah, Oracle fully established, okay, built okay. out like okay, five years cool. from now, back in 07 or 10 years from now, whenever, however long it would take. Okay, so let's, we got to paint this scenario properly. So when is this implemented? Is this implemented in 2003, 2000, 2006? Because that changes things. It really does. I guess before they started doing the whole mortgage, before they start securitizing mortgages. Okay, let's say let's say right after the dot com, so two thousand two. Okay, so two thousand two. This is around, and let's say every mortgage holder has their own smart contract. Let me explain what a smart contract is. Smart contracts effectively do three things uh, at a very basic level: they store rules, they verify rules, and they execute functions based on those rules. And a good analogy of a smart contract is a vending machine. When you go to a vending machine. The storing of rules is knowing that V6 is a bag of Doritos. The verifying of rules is knowing that once you put a dollar in, that the dollar is real. And then the executing function based on those rules is when you click V6, the ring spins around and now you have your bag of Doritos. That's exactly how smart contracts work on chain. They're yeah, so it's if then. Yeah, if then you can program it to do whatever you want based on memory of data and things that you can do with that data. Yeah, I would just add that it's black and white. So if this happens, then this happens. And if that function isn't executed, the contract won't disperse funds or do whatever the end goal is. 
Yeah, and that's, that this, is, this is why people are saying that smart contracts can replace intermediaries because if you mm -hmm. are trying to do a transaction and you have a smart contract that says once said party gives me the money and said party gives the product, they will get dispersed. So if one person puts the product there and the other person tries to get it without putting the money, you can put like a timer on the smart contract and the product will go back to the person. No one can get fucked over. So, exactly, exactly. Um, and that that's great for companies who work on like a net 30 basis as well in which their payment is delayed so yeah that's a great function to have in your business mm -hmm. yeah we're going to see smart contracts evolve over the years so imagine if every mortgage holder had a smart contract that represented them individually and every time they got a mortgage <clears throat> the smart contract was updated every time their credit score went up or down their smart contract updated every time their bank account stopped getting paychecks the smart contract would be updated if that level of clarity was provided with what was packaged packaged in these mortgages, crisis averted. Well, those people wouldn't have got approved in the first place. They wouldn't exactly. have had a home. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which wouldn't have allowed them. To but be let's say even. These, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. But even let's say even if they were packaging it, but and you know they were still somehow able to, because the value is always understood and not just by the entity yes, that yes. created it. Because what happens yeah. is you have an investment bank that created it. They sell it to a hedge fund. That hedge fund sells it to a sovereign wealth fund. That sovereign wealth fund sells it to another hedge fund. And now the value gets lost because they're just, it's like playing hot potato, you know? So imagine playing hot potato and then you have a tracker on the temperature. So you know when things are about to bust. So you can say, oh, I don't want to buy this because of that, not just right right Lions right and, 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 and you know a lot of institutions had like they knew that banks and non-banks were transferring toxic toxic assets so once again that goes back to the earlier example it's like if you're if i'm bear stearns and you're someone else jp morgan or bank of america and i'm trying to sell you some toxic asset for liquidity purposes well you're gonna know up front you're going to know before that transaction takes place, like, ah, these wouldn't be good to hold, especially given where monetary policy is right now. It just it, it, it wouldn't be good for us. I can see us going under just for that. that. I mean, that simple aspect right there, it eliminates systemic risk that was there because they were playing hot potato with horrible assets, with horrible quality borrowers. So, yeah, even if, you know, the Oracle Network and CCIP was implemented after like the the biggest run up of subprime lending, it would still mitigate the effects of the disaster that took place a hundred percent. It's crazy, man. I'm excited for this stuff to evolve. So now let's talk about this Swift par partnership. And before we do, let's talk a little bit about Swift. I know we touched on it earlier in a video, but so Swift has been around for over 50 years. They are a private key infrastructure you hear about like private key encryption swift was doing it before crypto crypto is not new it's just a bunch of things like mixed together and part of that is the swift yeah. system they sign the most transactions with value in the world and like we said earlier it's mainly value that moves between banks corporate treasuries and other banks over do you know how much they process banks. do you know how much they process on a daily basis i actually don't know the number i do not you know, also they send information to each other. And another thing that you may not know is that it's a member owned organization where the voting power is actually determined by the transactional usage of SWIFT. So the more, the higher your transactions are, the higher your voting power is. And that's how board member decisions are determined. So CCIP is integrating with SWIFT so that the world's banks can transact on blockchains. So you have literally the largest for-profit institution in the world in terms of moving money internationally coming on chain. I was just looking up, you know, what, what the volume through SWIFT is per day. And so according to integrated research, uh, in May 2021, they recorded an average of 42.3 million financial messages per day. Wow. That's pretty crazy, actually. Huh. I wonder why banks don't just email each other. Like, why do they have to send messages through Swift? Do you know? I'm assuming. I'm not going to assume anything. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. Because even even on blockchains, like you can you can you can put messages so because in the, it's, it, because in the transaction. It's, it's, I'm assuming that I am going to assume here that they're referring to 
the transactions, like you know, trans uh, transferring value and security, like money like, oh, payments this and security. Like, kind of like on Zelle when you say, "Oh, send in this amount for a rent payment or something." Yeah, like that. and that's a, it's a message that you're sending through a network, but it's a financial message, meaning like we're still sending money. So that's what I'm because they send money through SWIFT. That's what they do. So that's what the financial messages would be. And you know, you did just say it, and that you know they were doing encryption, encrypting financial messages before you know bitcoin and you probably crypto don't want became... that on email actually because it can easily be tampered with so that makes sense actually oh you're talking about yeah so like along with the payment transaction they probably have you know written notes like zell like you said so and it's securities as well and it probably comes with a report attached to that security or something like that i don't know yeah never had enough money to use swift guys so i don't know is there a minimum to use swift I mean, I'm assuming it is. You gotta be doing some volume. You gotta be a big, big boy. So, what's the difference? But it wouldn't, it wouldn't and a be, wire. And, and you gotta be a bank and an institution. Uh, oh, so it's not for like users to use it. It's the banks. That yeah, may, I mean, we, I knew we, that. You, like, yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, we can't just go use Swift. <laughs> huh? Be but like, yeah. hey, Swift me. Yeah, nah, that jump probably be expensive. It says forty-two point three million messages. So in dollars, that actually translates to about five trillion per day. Do you know what the fees are like on Swift? No, let me see if I can find some. Yeah, I'm gonna have to come back with that one. I don't okay. think I'm gonna be able to find so, that. Guys, this is huge because like you hear about the central banking digital currency and how it'll allow central banks to to communicate with around three to five percent. So damn near your standard processing fees. Okay. You hear about central bank and digital currencies and how central banks will, you know, be able to eliminate a lot of the smaller banks and, you know, pretty much work with us like directly if they want. They're going to need CCIP to do that because that's the only way. That's the only way. Like their existing technology doesn't have the bandwidth to do that. So. I just I just made that connection right now. That's crazy. Yeah. And then once again, they don't want to spend that money. So yeah, I mean, it is the only way, hundred percent. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Do you think it's them not wanting to spend the money because they are the Fed? Like it's like you know what I mean? Oh, we're talking about the Fed here. The, the central bank and digital currency. So it's like oh, uh, it's I think it's like oh, a time I, slash I think I you. Yeah, I thought you were talking about regular banks. So we're talking about central banks using CCIP for CBDCs. I wouldn't say it's the only way that, you know, they are spending the money right now on a CBDC infrastructure and they already have that infrastructure in Fed now. And then, you know, the second iteration of that or some iteration of that will be an actual central bank or Fed digital currency, the currency itself uh, that operates on top of Fed now or whatever blockchain they decide to go with in the future. Um, and I guess, yeah, now that I just kind of talk through all that i do realize like yeah i would agree that ccip because it will be in the infrastructure between banks and using swift i'm assuming that's just how when the federal reserve transacts with banks and institutions they use structured investment vehicles like they use special purpose vehicles or structured investment vehicles sibs or spvs to actually transact. So they create another entity to transact with the Federal Reserve because they can't transact directly with the financial institutions. So they have to create some like offset of that bank itself. That's how BlackRock, you know, operates with the Fed. They don't ever just send it to BlackRock's bank. Shit, they probably do without telling us. But, you know, it's supposed to be like some type of other vehicle there in which the Fed transacts with. You know, they can't transact directly with them. And so, yes, in order for the CBDC I guess to be transferred to banks and other institutions. I guess I don't know because I don't know the full capability of the Federal Reserve, and it's hard to ever uh, understand that because they can just create something. But at the same time, if they want to leverage existing infrastructure during the time at which a CBDC is actually created, that existing infrastructure would have CCIP in the middle of it for transactions because you have SWIFT there. So, I mean, it could be. It could be the only route. Yes. It's crazy how all this stuff is lining up, man. Even yeah. on-chain treasuries, like we're talking about uh, how it's beneficial for treasuries to come on-chain because you have, this is the first time when crypto has been around and interest rates are high and they're going to be high for a minute. 
So imagine being able to hold your stable coins and just get a yield because stable coins are already back with treasury. So they can just pass that yield along to you. So now these treasuries, like where the, the exchanges are, where you buy them can talk to the stable coin through CCIP. And now they're able to, to facilitate that. Like, man, they are just, it's crazy. Yeah, right? Manto, Manto and Pendo Finance are the two that I, I would think of. Yeah, I know we're going to do a video on that one of these days, treasuries on the blockchain. Yeah, be on the lookout for that, guys. Let's talk about the DTCC, which stands for Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. So CCIP and Chainlink is also helping them get on chain. Let's talk about what they are. So they are the settling and clearing agency for all securities in the U.S. Equities, like pretty much all assets being cleared. And this is mandated by law. And they settle two to four quadrillion dollars with a Q per year. You can look at them like an ACH, like an automated clearinghouse thing. You know, it is either is either going to effectively decline those transactions or clear them. So, <laughs> yeah, that's what we're. Talking. Yeah. So CCIP is aiming to help the DTCC be able to interact with various chains and allow these tokenized securities from the DTCC to go on chain. And in a world where that's happening, like you can just imagine, or you can't even imagine the amount of stablecoin transactions and private key holders that will come about. And then just when they do, like they're gonna buy some crypto just because. Like institutions, when they buy, when they buy crypto, hedge funds, any kind of major financial institutions, they use stable coins first. They put their money on chain and they purchase a stable coin and they hold the stable coin, mainly USDC, while they're waiting to allocate it into an asset and then especially if you have on-chain treasuries and they can get a yield holding that stable coin like man man that that wouldn't be i feel like that that's a long time if ever if that's uh legal in the us i just wonder but, when they would actually treasuries on the blockchain again like it's not legal in the us on any any platform is to it buy a treasury illegal? it's illegal to buy a treasury on the blockchain that's why like those companies who are like Pendle Finance and Mantle, they have KYC, AML, but the KYC portion is making sure that they're not serving US customers. And so I was actually watching, uh, it was a Bankless podcast at one point and the Mantle uh, founder, he actually said that if they have like some type of system in which it, if you're a US customer, it's going to know like based on oh, whatever yeah, yeah it's that. going to know and like you're not going to get the full user experience it actually be missing a lot you probably lose some money it might crash on you so it's like some way they can tell that you're in the us and it's it will probably fuck them up if they were to keep you on the platform so i would say it's illegal for them to have us customers not for us to buy treasuries on the blockchain if that makes sense okay so now let's talk about chain link's competitive advantage and this is one of the craziest competitive advantages in crypto it's not the craziest like you look at ave and compound well their competitive like, advantage is the the software and the utility we went over this is just like their dominance at this point yeah like but when they, you're talking about volume and price it's a large disparity in terms of their market cap as well as people like, using uh, yeah. oracles let me share yeah exactly 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 before you even get into it, it's important to note that the entire market cap of Oracles is 4.6 billion, as you guys will see on the screen. And so just, I'm gonna let you take it away now, talking about the uh, singular market cap of each, but but yeah, just keep that number in mind in totality, that the entire market value or market cap of Oracles in general is about 4.6 billion. Okay, so if we look here, like he said, 4.6 billion, Chainlink's market cap is 4.1 billion. Pretty much like 90 something percent of the market. Oh, their man, next competitor crazy. is Ban Protocol, and their market cap is 194 billion million, even though they're up 36 percent on the past 30 days, 40 percent on the last seven days. They're still extremely, extremely far. And like you have, man, what caused, whoa, what caused Hold that uh, seven day pump? You know what? I don't know, man. I have no huh. idea. Interesting. That's uh, crazy yeah but uh this is crazy man like their their next competitor is is just miles and miles away bro dropping the bucket bro imagine imagine having 4.1 billion dollars now imagine 
having a friend who has that and you guys are trying to compare and you realize you only got 190 million and he has four billion. that's a big difference i mean he can buy like three yachts if you buy one you're gonna be struggling that's like 400 bucks to one dollar <laughs> yeah it's crazy the difference is insane i wish we could find that chart visualizing it man that would be cool so now let's talk about the tokenomics because the thing with crypto that you don't have to worry about in stocks as much is that just because the protocol does well it doesn't always translate to the token price when it usually does with stocks because like these crypt these cryptos they're they're using their token to fund different things or to pay for different things within the network sometimes they get burned sometimes they have a crazy inflation so you really have to you really have to know so yeah and i don't uh, think they have like a fixed supply either do they yeah oh do they okay yeah we're gonna go to that so as you can see here you always want you see Chainlink has a market cap of four billion pretty much but the, the fully diluted valuation is seven billion so you get market cap by uh, multiplying the circulating supply by the price but when you look at traditional finance they always go off the fully diluted valuation because you want to take into account the maximum supply so their maximum supply is one billion link tokens and only 556 billion is in circulation so we need to figure out when the rest of those 400 billion or so is coming onto the market and it, is it coming in a large tranche do we need to worry about shorting or selling when that time comes like these are things you you always need to be aware of in crypto so before we get into that let's talk about like why the link token is used uh and how it has value in comparison to how well Chainlink as a protocol does so data providers also use the token and when i say data providers i'm talking about node operators anyone who is like doing things uh like helping run these different oracle networks and the cha chain link uses the token to give them incentive to keep the network secure and this is how they keep the network secure like it's game theory baked in just like it is in bitcoin in the sense that if you verify an illegitimate transaction you're pretty much wasting money and in eth your money can even get slashed with proof of stake because you have to stake if you prove something that's illegitimate you lose your stake yeah the, su the subscriber yeah like the subscriber their monthly payment uh in link tokens would literally every time enhance the security so over time kind of like bitcoin uh the protocol the chain link protocol becomes more secure or that specific oracle network will become more secure um as it as it gets more validators as it gets more effective capital as well in the form of fees and a subscription payment yeah and this is a perfect segue to this so the data subscriber gives the token to the data provider data providers also use the token as collateral and lock it into smart contracts we talk about we talked about what smart contracts are so node operators must stake a minimum amount of link in order to participate in the network and earn rewards in link the requesting smart contract holder pays the chain link node operators and link tokens for their services based on the data requested and link tokens are also used to compensate network data suppliers for their work so so if you go here we, we already know it's a billion tokens this talks about the token allocation for link so 35 percent of the tokens are went on sale initially with the launch of chain link 30 percent goes to the company and this is the the part we have to worry about and 35 percent is set aside to incentivize the node operators to pay them or compensate them for the things we just described i just always wonder you know when it comes to and i love chain link obviously as not really emotionally love i just love the prospects of uh, growth potential so just to clarify that i don't emotionally love it really if it went away tomorrow i would still talk about the value of what they're doing just the project failed at it right and i always wonder how centralized does a project become because you're allocating tokenies uh, uh tokens to the company mm -hmm. and in this case 30 percent. and so it's like you know the network itself of oracles is decentralized but is it the decentralized project when you have tokens allocated towards yourself because you still have a relatively high incentive in doing certain things creating certain uh innovations whatever it may be so yeah that's always a question for me when they allocate a ton back to themselves and 30 percent is a good chunk to be honest so yeah and then also it's worth noting jt that this 30 percent was initially it's gone down because like during the 2021 bull market you had the company selling off 
uh, link tokens to fund, you know, certain operations. Yeah. And this is why, like, uh, I think it was per month, you have like a 1.2 to 1.4% inflation in link tokens coming onto the market. And then if you guys want to track that stuff, you go here, you hover over circulating supply, and it shows you like where the predominant tokens are locked. So it's like it's different decentralization modalities in the sense that the network is decentralized, which is the most important thing. But the token isn't as decentralized. But as the companies can continues to sell off or not um, or buy back their own tokens when it's cheap, just like stock uh, public companies do, you know, that'll determine like the current decentralization. If you use token supply as a a proxy for figuring out if it's decentralized or not because some people may not on my list most people may not like that's if they use the token supply how much the company is getting as a proxy for decentralization determining if it's decentralized or centralized based on the amount of tokens the company owns because some people might not look at it that way you know yeah it's still it's it's still a subjective sense yeah 100 100 percent. yeah i'm looking at it strictly from like an investment standpoint I'm no, I, know, I, know, I know yeah so it's like and this is why you always take profit guys because it's like no matter how good chain link is um it's gonna go up and it's gonna go down just like apple yeah. did and it's the most valuable company in the world and we're gonna talk about our take profits strategy yeah, right here now it's down 86 percent from its all-time high or something like that yeah so look at moving on on this here you saw that you know we talked about the public sale token that's the, all of those are already out and in 2020, you saw a lot of tokens from node operators as well as the company come onto the market. The company sold a lot. And this is what I was just saying before. And um, I was I went through their their first white paper as well as the Chainlink 2.0 white paper. There was not a tokenization or not tokenization. There was not a tokenomic section on there. This was the most data I can find on it other than some Coinbase institutional write up that was published in 2021 so that isn't as relevant right now so it seems like there is no set schedule no cliffs or anything like that for them to sell the tokens so they can probably just sell whenever they want so that's even more the reason of like you want to have take profit levels so that once the price goes up they're probably going to sell some too so you definitely should too and they own fucking 20 to 30 percent of the supply so that's a lot of sell pressure because that could be on the price of link token so take profits guys like i recommend having a bag that you know like maybe 10 20 percent that you don't touch for 10 years because like this is going to be a multi-trillion dollar market cap eventually like owning the foundation of the new internet but you want to be take pro- taking profits along the way because there will be better investment opportunities that present themselves and you want to be liquid in order to take advantage exactly now that we established the fundamentals now that we established the tokenomics and why it makes sense to buy let's go into some technical analysis and look at this chart so first we're going to look at link usd or you know tether which is us dollar so as you can see here it went from like 40 cents at its high it went up to 53 i have been buying it since a dollar and as you can see right now it's been consolidating since uh june of 2022 right now what i want to see that will confirm like oh chain link is about to it's about to go on a run i want to see a break and retest of this zone so i want to see this i want to see it break here i want to see it retest this and not just come down and touch it but i want to see it print a nice big green candle on the weekly or the monthly because that's saying like momentum is on our side. So you can see that example right here. These, this is the monthly chart. So each candle represents one month. We saw this break and we saw this retest here and you saw this nice big green candle. Uh, and a few months later, we saw it go off to the races. A better example would be in the weekly here. So we go back here, we saw this nice big green candle. And from where that candle, candle printed to right here, you got 150%. That's pretty good. Even right here, you saw this wick retested. That's a red one. So I would have probably waited until these two big green candles print. And, you know, I don't even have to measure. Yeah, and that's the range. It's funny. That's the range in which I actually first started buying Chainlink in is around, I think it was $14 to $17. The highest price I bought it was $24. 
and I basically sold it all when it hit about 40, 46, I think. And uh, so it just shows, you know, because you were saying you, were, you bought it at a dollar. Um, so it's important to note, you know, if you do miss something like if you don't get to buy it at a dollar, even if you're not buying at seven dollars right now, there will still be opportunities for you to make gains, even if you're buying at, you know, 17, whatever it may be. So exactly. Exactly. And, and it's then, good. It's good to under. That's why it's important to do technicals, because it helps you understand that. And you don't feel as lost or you don't feel as much FOMO sometimes if you have a good grasp on your fundamentals and your charts. But go ahead. Go ahead. Exactly. And so it's like this is this goes to having a plan and like our course, we show you how to do conduct research like we're showing you here. We show you how to find good liquidity pools to yield firm, which we're going to do here. Show you how to generate passive income in case you can't buy it or in case you just want to accumulate it passively. So the three things I look for, it's not just a break and retest of this trend line. I wanted to retest my 200 day because as you can see, whenever the market's been on top of the 200 day, for the most part, and these these are all just confirmations, not like, oh, it's for sure thing. You just, it's just extra confirmation. The more confirmations you have, the better. Whenever the market was on top of this blue, which is the 200 day, line which is the, the the average of the past 200 candles and this 62 ema which is like rolling fibonacci it's been in a bull market right now we are under the 62 ema we're under the strong support line so i want to see it break and retest our 62 our support as well as our 200 day ema which is already on top of so i need two more confirmations as well as a bit green candle so that's four confirmations until then i'm not i'm not getting in and as far as taking profits these lines I have are big liquidity levels where people were buying and selling. As you can see, this is a, a lot of this was tested as a resistance here, resistance here, support, support. Same with these levels here. So it'd be good to you want to have a plan to get out before you get in. So for me, I'll be taking profits at 15, 25, 30, as well as like all time highs and then just keep a moon bag and just keep taking profits as it goes up. Now, having that said, when you're investing, it's all about risk management. So you don't want to just look at ETH or, or LINK compared to USD, USDC or USDT. You want to look at it compared to other assets such as Bitcoin and Ethereum that are less risk averse, but also have a high chance for profitability as well. Like we saw ETH go to 5K. I think this next bull cycle, ETH will go to 10, 20K. So if I can hold ETH, for a low risk, then I'm going to do that. So I want to see how Chainlink is performing against Bitcoin and Ethereum. So you do ratios. So this is Link BTC. Whichever uh, asset is first, that's saying like when the market's going up, Link is outperforming Bitcoin. When the market's going down, Bitcoin is outperforming Link. So as you can see with this run up, we saw Link perform outperform BTC by a large amount. But ever since, what's that, August of 2020? Bitcoin has been outperforming link and it's been in this downward channel. Now, again, I would rather hold Bitcoin than link right now. When that will change is when I see a break and retest of my trend line of my 62 EMA of my 200 day, as well as this resistance point right here. And that would look like this. Break, retest, nice big green candle right here. And then you get in on the confirmation, right? And you saw that happen right here. You had a break, retest, nice big green candle, candle, and then it was to the moon. Same thing with Ethereum. Ethereum has been majorly outperforming Link, but it's been in this consolidation zone for a long time. Same thing. I want to see a break and retest of my 200 day, my 62 EMA, as well as this uh, support line. And I want to see a nice big green candle. Just like we saw right here, this was a strong resistance level. We saw a break. We saw a retest. And again, this retest acts as a zone. It's not, it doesn't have to come right to the line, but we saw it pretty much come right to the top of our 200 day. It was above our 62 and above our trend line. And you saw what happened. You always want to wait for the confirmation. You can't time anything, but you can you can confirm where momentum is moving. And you can you can look at the momentum based on these green bars down here or volume, I meant, not momentum. Now that we looked at those, let's talk about yield farming. So I'm gonna go back to Chainlink USD, right? So as you can see, 
it's been from May of 2022 up until now, it's been in the range of $5.35 and $8.74. So good risk management says you provide liquidity within that range. And then I like to set up less amount of money within a tighter range. So from $6.41 and $7.64. So that if it goes out of range there, like how it did here, 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 here. I'm still within my other range, still generating passive income. So there's a platform called Builder Metrics, and I interviewed the CEO of this company. His name's Jake. Feel free to watch that video on how to use it. But you pretty much go on here and you can toggle it so it's priced in USDC or ETH. You literally just copy the numbers that you had on your chart. So I had $5.53 at the bottom range, $8.74 at the top. And remember, this is Uniswap V3, so it's not going to be the exact numbers because this is in ticks. So it's going to give you to what that closest tick is. So this is with a thousand dollars on Link USDC on the Ethereum mainnet. Now you can look on Aperture, or you can look on Polygon, you can look on Optimism, you can look on Arbitrum, like you can look on multiple chains. But I'm just showing you how this looks for ETH with a thousand dollars with that range that I just showed on my chart. You can be getting a 37.44% APR. Now, again, this is calculating based on the past 30 days. Monthly, 3%. So with $1,000, you can make 30 bucks a month or $374 a year. And that's not factoring in compounding if you take your rewards and put them back into your pool. That's the past 30 days. If, you want, if you're a little more risk averse, let's say you go past 60 days. You reload the chart. 33% APR, 2.7% per month. It gives you the liquidity distribution. It gives you all the data here, the TVL history, the volume history, and it even shows you the top positions. So now I'm not going to go through all of the chains, but I just want to give you guys an idea. And then it says automate on Aperture here. So Aperture is a platform. I made a video on that. It helps you like manage your liquidity pool. So you can say, hey, once it gets to this range, take me out. Let's say you want it to uh, use Aperture to take profits, like you're using it to take profit. You can say, hey, you can set a range from, I don't know, $5.53 all the way up to $14.98. And on Aperture, you can put, once it hits $14, take me out. So now you're out with all your USDC and all of your fees. So you essentially use it to take profits in case you're not by your computer and it just wicks up and goes back down. You didn't miss out. So now this is linked USDC on Arbitrum. OK, and I didn't go through all this. So it gives you the TVL and you can compare like where is most of the TVL? You want to find pools with high volume to TVL ratios. You want if the volume is higher than the TVL, even better. So the higher this number is, the better. So as you can see on ETH mainnet is 15.32 on Arbitrum is 15.02. So it's a little better on ETH right now. But you do want to factor in gas fees because Arbitrum's fees are cheaper than Ethereum mainnet. So you go down here, you can be getting a yield of 29.25%. So ETH was getting you 32, I believe. This one's getting you 29. So you're getting $24 a month. And this is the 30 days. But if I go to here, let's see here. So on here, I'm on 69 days. Let's see how the past 69 days would have gotten you on Arbitrum. I hit reload chart. And let's compare and contrast. So 31.25%. Versus 33.1%. So it's probably it probably ends up being the same if you factor in the gas fees for Ethereum. But the cool thing about Aperture is you can like rebalance in one fell swoop without having to withdraw, redeploy, and plan a gas fee on each of those. You pay the gas fee one time. And now, before we wrap up here, let's go through the like let's say you want to provide liquidity for link BTC. You want to generate passive income in link and ETH instead of USDC or link in BTC instead of link in USDC. So this is not a good pool. You see the TVL is only $451. It's pretty much no data. So you don't want to just enter a pool. You always want to do your research first, like having a plan, knowing before you get out, before you get in. But you also want to know your volume, the TVL. You want to know uh, how much is in the pool, the fees, the risk, like all that stuff. And if you do your research on this one, you will see that this is not a pool to get into. Now let's look at Link ETH. So this one that is actually pretty good. It is risk is safe. 
you have a volume of TVO ratio is 14.97%. The TVO is 35 million. You might be asking, well, if it's priced in ETH and LINK, like how do I know what that is? Literally all you do, you go to your LINK ETH chart and you just copy and paste these numbers. So my purple line says 0.003264. The top line says 00.5956. You see I have 00 0.034, which is the closest tick. And I have five, six at the top, but you can get to four, nine. And you get an APR of 43.22% in Chainlink and Ethereum. That's pretty good, guys. And you got to keep it pretty, pretty fire, actually. You, you got to keep in mind, it's been in this range since November of 2021. So you will be in range most of the time. And if you had a tighter range from like, let's say you want to go from 3951 and 5215. Let's say 4042 at the bottom. 46 so that's that tick and then at the top let's say you go 5125 and it's been in here since november 2021 bro that's 57 percent. so november 30th till mm -hmm. now 688 days okay that's 2021 november 30th 688 okay let's just say for the past year because it won't let you go back that far so for a year straight, you can be you could have been getting and it goes up and down, but on average, twenty-four point fifty-eight percent. So off a thousand dollars per year, you're making two hundred and forty-five bucks, not factoring in compound. Compound's gonna probably make this depending on how much you compound, probably like 30, 40, 50 percent. And monthly, probably 40, 50 bucks. That's pretty good, guys. And an asset that's yeah, gonna that's pretty good guys. Back over the next decade. <laughs> And yeah, obviously you can keep adjusting those ranges. So, I mean, you know, it's, you could literally be making low risk capital at the tune of, you know, 20, 30% APR just by understanding the price movement of an asset. And if you feel the need to adjust that range, which you probably will based on price movement, or you could just leave it there. And it's not like you're going to lose your capital there if you're providing concentrated liquidity. So yeah, that's just that was a fantastic break, breakdown, bro, and it shows the potential of earning passive income with relatively low risk at any point in time. Now we we you just did the example going back to November twenty twenty one. So imagine if you were earning, let's say twenty four percent on your capital since November twenty twenty one. I mean that's that's pretty good if you're earning it consistently, and you have to adjust the range just slightly sometimes. But now you can actually automate that with uh, Aperture. Aperture. So, yeah. So, yep. yeah, that's pretty fire. Yeah. So, guys, if you want to learn how to do this kind of stuff, if you want to learn how to conduct proper research, make sure you're secure so you don't get hacked and lose your honeypot, your hard-earned money. Find these pools because I only, I only went on ETH and yeah. Arbitrum. I didn't go on Optimism and Matic and yeah. all the other chains. Um, some of them are hard yields. If you want to know how to find these pools, how to manage your risk, how to generate passive income on not just blue chip assets, but the right assets at the right time. We have the best yield farming course in the world. We have some of the best coaches in the world. We are looking for people who are self-motivated. This is going to be like a CFA level education. This isn't for people who are just trying to get rich overnight or who is not trying to take this serious. If that fits your description, this program is for you. So with that, I thank you guys for watching. Make sure you follow both of our personal YouTube channels. I'm Crypto Noah. Talk about all things crypto, DeFi, yield farming. Follow JT at J Mansion. He talks about economics, Federal Reserve, uh, fundamental, going over some charts sometimes. But yeah, always keeping up with the current times. I like to just say keeping up on the world. So if you follow my channel, you'll keep up on the world. And uh, plus, you'll always get we're pretty much always together now so yeah you'll always get some DeFi too <laughs> yes sir yes sir so subscribe to know it Owls as well and uh i thank you guys for tuning in let us know what project you want us to cover next and we'll see y'all on the next one i'm about to go get some grub guys so this is a good long one appreciate you for listening as always see you on the next one